Sorry. I was waiting for Judy Marvin, who's still looking for parking. Uh, there are a couple of things going on here at the high school tonight, so parking is at a premium. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you for giving up your Mardi Gras plans to be here tonight. <laughs> I did bring some beads to help us celebrate. <laughs> At least 15 years ago, I was bugging Barden Stevenow to write down all his stories. When it was becoming evident that he wasn't going to do it, I got Judy, David, and Sally, and we recorded two hours of his memories. Tales of Calaveras is just that, a compilation of stories. This version should really be called Seven Old White Guys. We have approximately two hours of each interviewee, which will be housed at the county archives. And instead of watching 14 hours worth of footage, what you're about to see are snippets of each interview. First and foremost, I need to thank Brent Harrington and the Calaveras Community Foundation. Thank you. I know, Brent, you're here tonight, but if there are any foundation members, could you please stand up? Thank you. I want to thank you for expanding your rules to allow us to hire professionals to compose this film. Those professionals, sorry, those professionals are Manuel Crosby and Morgan Page. Are you here? Where are they? They were supposed to be here tonight. They're probably stuck with weather. In any case, you'll know Manuel as a Calaveras filmmaker who his first directorial feature film debut was First Date, and that was entered into the Sundance Film Festival. I wanted to thank him for his expertise, patience, and dedication to this project. He put far more into it than was ever imagined. I'd also like to thank Morgan, his partner. This film wouldn't be what, what it is without her. Thank, I want to thank her for finding the narrative thread and weaving this story together, making it accessible to people who don't know the history of Calaveras, and mostly for the arduous task of getting the interviewees together. We had so many people that said they really wanted to do an interview, and when the day came, they bailed on us in droves. <laughs> we got every excuse in the book, from rescheduled doctor's appointments to failing hearing aids. Funny, it was all the women that dropped out. Tad Fallendorf and I had to fill in with the interviews to keep the project going and on budget. I hope by viewing this film tonight, you'll see the importance of recording these tales for posterity. There are so many stories in this room right now that need to be captured. I wish my family's stories had been recorded. Martin Hubbardy was my grandfather. He was born and raised in Fourth Crossing. He became a world-renowned water and soil scientist at the University of California, and he created their oral history program. I didn't know until I started this project that he'd done that, so it must be in the blood. I believe you can tell a lot about a community by how they treat their history. We need to know our history, no more now more than ever, especially when so many of our historic buildings are under threat. Our history is who we are as a community, and that shouldn't be erased. Am I sounding like a politician yet? <laughs> Seriously, you may think your stories are not relevant or interesting, but that doesn't mean they won't be to someone else and to future generations of Calaveras. I implore you to meet Sierra, she'll be at the desk outside, and sign up in the lobby afterwards if you would like to do an interview, or if you know someone that you think should do one, sign them up and I'll get Tad to shame them into doing it. <laughs> Is Judy here yet? I still, she's still looking for parking, I was trying to wait for her. Um, I just really wanted to thank Judith and Tad for your never-ending support, no matter what the project is. Chloe, I saw you run in. You're a doll. Thank you for representing the Old Timers Museum. <laughs> Jessica, thank you for being that rock that allows me to venture off to get these projects done. Uh, Dave Dugan and Lynn Porovich, thank you for making it so easy in this beautiful theater. Lastly, I'd like to thank Doug, Mike, Phil and Tad for having the guts to sit down and do this. <laughs> this screening is dedicated to Roy and Barden. How wonderful it is to have them both with us tonight. Thank you.
What Calaveras meant to me was the better part of my lifetime. The first two years or three years of my life I've been here. Uh, and, and my age today is 89. Calaveras County is my home. It's the root of several generations of the family. Home. It, it's always been Calaveras. Calaveras County. Many have come over the decades and continue to come from far and wide today to put down roots, create a home, and pass on stories for future generations. Here are some of those stories. Roy Joseph Sirocco. I was born in San Francisco. My family actually returned to Angel's Camp probably about 1936, 37. Barden Stephen O. I was born in San Francisco, so presumably I arrived here in an automobile in 1936, but it was kind of a return to home. Douglas Howard Josie, born in Dameron Hospitals, but been in Mountain Ranch for 80 years. Tad Fallendorf. I grew up on Mark Twain Road in Angels and didn't move far away since. Martin Richard Hubbard II. I grew up in Sacramento, but I grew up coming here almost every weekend. Yeah, I've known it all my life. Michael Ray Del Orto. My family was in McCallum Hill, and I was born in a doctor's office in San Andres. Phil Alberts. I came to Mountain Ranch from Shovel Lake, Minnesota. Some of the earliest European settlers to the area arrived in the mid to late 1800s. It was the gold rush and Calaveras was the mother load, which led some to establish long running history in the area. John Hubbard, he came from Luxembourg and he came in 1854 and he originally went to McCullamy Hill. He then moved on to Chile Gulch. Uh, he was here for the gold, for prospecting. He ended up buying the American restaurant, which is now the uh, county archives. He married a woman named Maria Teresa Burkhart. They had five children. She died in childbirth with her fifth child. And he sent back to Luxembourg for help. So his father came and his nieces. And they uh, were helping him with these children. And then two years later, he remarried and had eight more children. On my father's side, my great-great-grandfather arrived in Calaveras in 1850 and uh, patented his ground, got a state patent for 1853, and uh, so that's five generations back. A rich hotbed for gold mining operations was the Carson Hill Mine. It's Carson Hill Mines. It's one of the more interesting ore bodies in the Mother Lode. It uh, produced uh, about 700,000 ounces of gold, I think, all together, maybe a million now. And uh, it was a big, a big geological horse tail in the Mother Lode. And in the early days, all the miners were down the river, down the Carson Creek, actually, looking for gold that had broken out of that ore body and washed down that creek. And it was very, very rich. There, uh, you know, some of the family letters think there were about 7,000 people there, although I doubt it. Anyway, somebody's horse got loose, the story goes, it went to the top of Carson Hill, and here was this quartz outcrop with gold sticking out like a man's hand, like a glove sticking up, solid gold. So they immediately started to, they got some of the the uh, Chilean and Mexican miners that knew underground work hard rock and they started to mine it. And uh, in the early days, according to my grandfather, they had one area up there that wasn't much bigger than a big living room where they blew out uh, several million dollars worth of gold. And as they blasted that gold, they, contrary to usually pounding the rock to get the gold out, they, they hit the, they broke the rock out of the gold, the stringers were just so thick gold. 
As mining activities blossomed in Calaveras, so too did the mining towns. Many other opportunities became available for settlers looking for their own piece of prosperity and a brighter future for their families. My grandfather was 24, and actually it was 1895 that these two boys came over from Italy, and they settled in Angel's Camp. The early history tells me that that my grandfather worked not in the mines, but probably worked uh, as a bartender. There was probably 30 or 40 bars in Angels and Elizabeth at that time. So he had plenty of chances, I guess, for employment. One of the stories that my dad told me that in the early days when Desiree Frico of Frico Ranch Schools up here and his wife Lillian were building their home. We see, it was about the same time, about 1895, that my grandfather and my dad helped build the mansion at Frico Ranch. And my dad helped with putting the first telegraph to Frico Ranch from Angel's Camp. Before long, a vibrant community of people from all over the world was growing right here in the Motherlode. The town was very diverse. I mean, as I, when we grew up, the Greek Orthodox Church was still operating, and the old Catholic Church was there, and there were a couple of Protestant churches, and, and the people were, I mean, there, there were waves of miners that came in from, from Wales, from Cornwall, from the Serbian countries. We had a big Serbian population, Italians. Whenever they had problems in Europe, and they got hungry, they made it for the States, and these mines were carried through from the gold rush till 1941. My mother said, uh, you know, the, the miners' band, they had a miners' band, and they got it, they got time off from work to play in the band when they needed them and for funerals and different things. So she said the miners' band would go, they get the old black hearse out and the black horses, and they would so at first we'd go up the street with the funeral dirge, dum dum da dum, and all the way up. And then a couple of hours would go by, and they, the, you know, the cemetery is up in Alleville, about a mile and a half away. And pretty soon the miners' band would come down the street, and they'd be playing. There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight, and they got to drink uh, a free drink from every bar that they went to when they did that. So my mother said they'd be sitting down in the middle of town with their, uh, with their trumpets and their drums in the gutter, banging on the tr drums and playing the trumpets, keep everybody awake all night. The gold of Calaveras wasn't the only resource. The wide open space and miles of green fields were invaluable for raising livestock which led to the beginnings of Calaveras County's deep-rooted ranching community. Grandfather Joe Delordo, he came in, it was 1876, I believe. In those days, you had to have a sponsor. So his sponsor was, turns out, somehow related as a cousin or a couple steps over from Switzerland who had gotten here before, had a ranch and did some other stuff there. And he sponsored both my grandfather and I believe a couple others that ended up in the area. The United States had a lot more opportunity than most of Europe had at that time. His sponsor was older, and he wanted to go back to Switzerland to die. So he transferred the property to my grandfather and one other person. They had a pretty large piece of ground. And then my grandfather kept adding to the ground because that's what you need for raising cattle. Yeah, he was the youngest boy, so he would have to work on the ranch. And then as he got older, he had his own cattle. And then after World War II, he didn't have any cattle anymore. My grandfather and his brother, George, they moved to Calaveras County and bought some property here in 1898, I believe. The ranch on below the cement plant was a place there and then another place out Calaveras. And then my dad, when he got out of high school, which was 1922, he went to work with his dad, run cattle and sheep, and continued and 
We're still doing it. <laughs> my dad and his father, they took the cattle to Blue Creek, which is in Calaveras County. In the summertime, sheep went to the Dardanelles, and my dad had a pretty serious wreck, and they didn't think he was going to make it. And my grandfather sold the cows and the sheep. A horse fell with him coming out of the mountains, and he was unconscious for 30 days. And uh, when he woke up, he didn't have any sheep, and he didn't have any cows, and a big debt. <laughs> and he continued, kept things together, and we came along, and his dad had sheep and cows and goats, and continued in the business. My grandfather drove 2,400 head of Angor goats from Red Bluff to San Andreas in 1919. And they slaughtered most of them to sell to the miners. They liked goat meat, and that was, Dad had a butcher wagon. They'd butcher goats and haul it to the mine camps, Maloney's and Jackson and Sutter Creek. And... The first child of the first marriage was Augustus John Hubbardy, and he settled off Fourth Crossing. So that ranch was in the family for, it's over 100 years that it was in the, in the family. They had uh, cattle, sheep, pigs, yeah, everything. And they would grow the food for the animals and themselves. So there was always a garden out back. I remember my great uncles always having like 10 dogs um, to help guard the sheep and, um, and the homestead. At any given time, they had four or five horses and then quite a few head of cattle. They used to run, my great uncles ran cattle up the hill to the high country for the summer and then would come back to the ranch for the fall and winter and spring. And my great uncles would can vegetables, fruit, and always had a, a larder full of food. And the stove, you know, it was a wood burning stove in the house. Um, it burned all day long. The fire was always going and there was always a kettle on the, on the stove. And then at night, obviously, they fired it up to cook the evening meal. Calaveras County settled into a ranching and mining lifestyle that supported its community. With the close of the 1920s, the Great Depression loomed. How well did Calaveras weather this global storm? My dad gave me stories around 1929 and 30, only being as discussed as the Great First Depression. And so the questions I asked him, I said, well, you know, how did you actually fare in those days? And his whole story was around the fact we were self-supporting. They had the ranch out there. They raised a few cattle, sheep, and, and livestock, and chickens, and pigs, and so forth. And they, they ranched and farmed uh, vegetable gardens. The things that they couldn't have money for, which they didn't have a lot of at that time, uh, they bartered for our, the grocery stores, like the Bachigalupis and Angels Camp. That's a that building still there, uh, and uh, they were they were kind of a hardware and and uh, marketplace and so forth. They would actually order for kerosene, other things that they needed for the vegetables they gave the store, and so forth. So they weren't hurting, basically, in the 29s or 30s for the Depression. They never had a depression in Angel's Camp because the mine started up with the, when everything else went down, supplies went down, the labor went down, the mines would go up. As decades passed, the nature of economic opportunities continued to shift and brought even more new faces into the county. My dad was an accountant, an auditor, born in North Dakota. And he came up here and went in the 30s to take the place of Pete Snyder, who was doing the job, and it was during the Depression. So he moved up from, from Lodi to here, and my mother came with him. She was a registered nurse. In fact, I was looking back at the, She was a 205th registered nurse in the state of California. She came up here and was a public health nurse, I think the first school nurse. Well, I didn't get to Calavera till I was 35 years old. In 1965, I was looking for a job. I bought a store, Domaguini's General Store in Mountain Ranch. 
Florinda Domagini that was the owner of the store. Uh, her and I made a financial agreement and she carried the paper for me because I didn't have much money. So she financed it. I rented the store out and I got in the real estate business. I would become a real estate salesman. Acreage, mountain property, up the hill. General store wasn't a gold mine, but the real estate business at that time was very lucrative. Although family origins may differ, a kindred experience was the Calaveras childhood. We'd sleep on the porch and they would always have all the windows open. And I can just remember, I must have been nine when I, I, when I first remember hearing stories and I'd press my ear up against the screen to try and hear what they were talking about. And they, you know, it'd be my father and the two great uncles and they'd be howling with laughter in there and just telling stories. We all look at our phones now and we all look at television, but we don't actually just sit down at the table and talk. And I think that's kind of becoming a lost art. And I think it's so important that people tell stories, especially the stories that they knew. So in Mosquito Lake, my grandfather had built a cabin there and my aunt, great aunt had built another cabin and so on. And it was a, it was a camp for people to get out of the heat of uh, Angel's Camp in the summer. And they spent a great deal of time there. So they took me up there from the time I was a baby. And during World War II is what I remember. I mean, in the early 40s, there were hardly any cars going by. And it was just this kid's paradise. And then we had a boat. I knew how to row it, I knew how to swim, I knew how to fish. And um, this lake was full of trout. There was no one else fishing. There wasn't anybody there, period. Because they, they were on gas rationing. So there'd be maybe anywhere from half a dozen to a couple dozen cars would go by on any given day. A lot of them would stop, wave at us, tell us the news of the war, come over for a cup of coffee, um, take a swim in the lake. We, we, a typical day, we get up, get our pancakes, with the, leave the extra pancakes for the chipmunks out in the rocks and pack a little water from the lake to wash dishes, pack water from the spring to, for drinking water. Uh, have a uh, siesta in the afternoon or read, and then uh, uh, I would fish. I was young enough, so I wasn't spending a lot of time with siestas. Generally speaking, I, it was you take a you get in the lake in the afternoon with a bar of ivory soap and swim around. And get that's how you took a bath, and then a big campfire in the evening, and lots of steam, a lot of campfire smell. It was it was pretty much made for a movie. When I was like a teenager, there was not that many people. There was like 9,000, 10,000 people in Calaveras County, and most of them had been here for a long time. I knew the names of people from the other side of the county, even though I'd never seen them, I knew what their reputation was. I mean, it was a smaller, smaller world in those days. And you know, I could go out <clears throat> if I wanted to go hunting, which I did a lot of, I could across a dozen ranches, and if I saw something, I would go tell the rancher or the owner what I saw and what I needed to know, and I was always welcome. I could go as far as I wanted, which was quite a ways, a lot farther I'd walk now. <laughs> <laughs> but it had all the things that you could do that you couldn't do someplace else, like the hunting, fishing, and so forth. And my dad was a great fisherman. He loved to fish. My brother was a, was a hunter in the family and uh, dove hunting and quail and, and ducks and everything. We did all that. We knew every car that went by the house, uh, maybe only three or four. Phone rang, you knew who, who was calling who. It was two of us. I went to grammar school in Mountain Ranch. It was two of us in the first grade, second grade, third grade. We drove cattle from Valley Springs to Bear Mountain, to San Andreas, to Mountain Ranch, to Railroad Flat. As a kid, we'd horse back up and down the road, we'd pick up beer bottles. You could get a penny a piece for beer bottles and dad would get mad at us for picking them up and put them in the culvert and then he'd come back and we'd pick them up later and sell them to Louis Domingue at the Domingue store. Penny a piece, get enough to get well, maybe a bag of peanuts for five cents. Maybe the first one I got paid for, I was 14, I think, and I was asked to help drive cows to the mountains. And we drove 
cattle from Mountain Ranch for Harold Lombardi to Lake Alpine, Bear Valley. And the next week, Buster Wooster asked me to help him, and I drove, and I got a dollar a day for a week. Then I started shearing sheep. I sheared sheep weekends and days after school, and that was source of income, primarily sheep shearing. I mean, it was part of growing up. That's the way life was. You, uh, I don't remember the war. You know, I was born, started the war, and uh, times were tough. I you know there was, there always something to do. I mean, it was, Dad always had plenty for us to do. I mean, cut hay, cut wood, move cows, build fence. Kids having fun out at the ranch, and it was so amazing and, uh, to be able to spend time there because those were the days where they said, go back and when it's dark, come home and you would just go explore all day long. And if it was jumping on the hay bales in the hay barn, or, you know, I had a go-kart out there for years, uh, you know, racing around the roads, or it was actually helping with the, with the chores, too. Fireman Fun Day, the fire department had a fun day they set up. It really started when, because we were little kids and my dad was in the fire department, and they used to burn lots in town. They didn't want the kids around, so, at the end, you know, look, they, they did something for the kids. Mainly it was designed for the firemen's kids because they start, it started in our yard on Mark Twain Road. They'd have cake and ice cream and, and give the firemen kids a ride on the truck for the fathers, I guess, giving up their time. So, and the mothers had put it on. Then, then it developed through um, Verl Minnow and a few other members of the fire department to have a fundraiser. So they turned it into Fireman Fun Day and the events merged and moved all down to the Park and Angels camp. And then they had regular carnival-like activities and raised um, funds for the volunteer fire department. The uniqueness of Calaveras extended far past childhood and into vibrant social affairs for all ages. John Hubbardy, he was known for giving the best barn dance in the county. The dances and the socials and, and, and uh, the excitement of that, that was the most exciting thing going on. And I, I think we kind of miss a little bit of that today. We had all kinds of things going on. There was a lot of things to do, uh, but in a small way. Every Saturday there was a dance somewhere. We had, when we were able to go, find a ride. West Point, Railroad, Wilsonville, uh, Glencoe, Mountain Ranch, Wallace, San Andres, Angels Camp, Copper. It was a dance pretty much every Saturday. Parties were parties, yes. You had to go everywhere where there was excitement. Yeah, and everything in McCallum Hill, there was always the fireman's ball, the women's club dancing show, which I got to go there when I was like 11, 12 years old as a Boy Scout, because we would open up the hat check booth. So we got to hang out where all the grown-ups were dancing and music was going on and everybody was celebrating. So it was pretty exciting to be able to do that, interact, you know, when you're 11, 12 years old. Well, they used to have Black Bart Days in San Andreas, which was a parade and a function, and it was a lot of fun with uh, parades. We'd done that. Don Cuno was one of the leaders in that bunch. I did a lot of functions in Mountain Ranch. I had a huge flea market. I had a Jim Canna. I had a hot air balloon extension. I had a wagon train from San Andreas to Mountain Ranch with 14 wagons in it, a couple hundred riders. I had a street dance. It had over a thousand people dancing in the street. Dan Elzick and the Renegades. Danny's still retired in San Andreas, but he had a country western band called the Renegades. They played music. I also had Randy Sparks, has a ranch down the road a ways, but uh, he played music at the Mountain Ranch uh, street dance. I had a little country store, and I, I learned a long time ago, a wise old man named J.C. Penny told me that you had to have traffic, so I created it. We have a lot of things that, that historically we've done which are pretty darn amazing. Um, and the one that has continued since 1929 is the frog jump. 
and being able to do the parade and the, and the frog jump every year. I think it's only ever been canceled twice. One was during World War II, one year it was canceled, and one year for COVID. And otherwise, um, they've made it happen every year, and it's a fantastic, you know, you don't see anything else like it. We used to go out and gather a whole bunch of frogs for the frog jump. Uh, the frog jump had, they furnished frogs for people that it would come up from every place to go there that they didn't have a frog, so they had a, a, a pond of frogs. Well, we used to make the frogs available for the Boosters Club. Calaveras County has been home to a number of colorful characters. One such figure was strongman Big Nels. Oh, Big Nels was one of the many characters of Angel's Camp that lived in the Calaveras Hotel that uh, my great-grandmother, Olivia Rolleri, uh, owned and operated. And Nels was part of the family. He'd been living there for a long, long time at the border. So he came and went uh, after he got through the mining days. He went off to the to, uh, Ringling Brothers Circus because he was tattooed from his ankles to his chin. And he had gold rings in his ears and gold rings through his chest muscles, which he lifted an anvil with in the circus. Big Nelly. You know, he just looked like a big tough. And I was young, so he looked kind of old, tough, and <laughs> and to me, he looked hardened. He was always friendly. He would visit with you in front of the hotel downtown. I remember him living there. When he was off, I guess he, he lived in the hotel. One of the most well-known figures to make their mark on Calaveras history was notorious outlaw Black Bart. Olivia Rolleri came from Italy and ended up down at Reynolds Ferry, which was down the river between Jamestown and uh, Milton or Copper Office. Time went on, and her son was about 18 years old, and it was my great uncle, Jimmy Valeri. And uh, one day the stage came through, and the, and the stagecoach driver said that he was going up to pick up some, some gold up in Jamestown, and he'd be back, stay overnight, and in the morning he'd take Valeri across because he saw some deer on the other side, so Valeri was going to hunt. And so he went up the hill, started up the hill with the coach, and then he stopped and let him off. And he went on up Funk Hill, is the name of it, to the top, uh, or near the top. And then uh, Black Bart stepped out from behind a rock and held up the stage, told him to throw down the strong box. Well, it was bolted down, so he told him to take the horses around the corner. And uh, so the stage driver took the horses around the corner and saw Jimmy Rolleri up on the ridge uh, looking for the deer to be flushed up to him and waved him down and uh, now they had a rifle and Black Bart banged away on the, on the safe box and, and was just escaping when they took a shot at him and the story goes that the stage driver took the first two shots and Rolleri, who was a very good shot, took the last couple he was nicked by Rolleri, he dropped a handkerchief, and the handkerchief had a laundry mark on it. And they'd been looking for this guy. He, he walked all over Central California. He was a, an amazing hiker, he, and, uh, and that's why they never caught him. He never rented a horse, never had a horse. And he had robbed you know, 30 or 40 stages, and Wells Fargo was after him big time. And this laundry mark, uh, they finally established, they went out and they found the handkerchief the next day, the sheriff did, and then they took it to Wells Fargo, took it to San Francisco. Uh, they traced the laundry mark and found, well, uh, found Black Bart living under another name with Bolton. So uh, they sent Jimmy Rolleri, uh, and they gave the stage driver one too, a uh, Winchester 73, a very fancy and great gun which burned in the hotel fire, which is a subsequent story to this one. And the end of that story, according to people in my family, was they always wondered what happened to him, because after he got out of San Quentin, he just evaporated, more or less. There were a couple of stage robberies, and then he disappeared. And they figured that Wells Fargo probably pensioned him off, or did him in, one or the other. Oh, I can tell you about Black Bart. 
the Calaveras Enterprise at that time, the editor was a man named Ernest Long, and he was a bigger bullshitter than I was. So he did a lot of stories on Blackboard. So I faked finding his grave, which Black Bart got out of San Quentin and disappeared. There's no legal or authenticated whereabouts of what happened to Black Bart. But I thought, well, why not? So in Mountain Ranch, up on the hill in the back of where that baseball diamond was, I found an old manzanita that had fell over from the wind, left a little indentation. So I found a stone about this big a square with the letter B carved on it. Where that come from, I'm not sure. So I poured a little water in the ground and sunk that in like it'd been there a long time. I found it. So I told him, Ernie Long, so he notified the Sacramento Bee and the Oakland Tribune and Channel 3 out of Sacramento. So they all came to Mountain Ranch. So I had a two days of the best lies I ever told. Nobody got hurt. It didn't cost anybody any money. Greatest con I ever put on. I loved it. One may not believe that Black Bart and Big Nels had any common ties. However, they were both brought together by hotel entrepreneur Olivia Rolleri. Grandma Rolleri was basically my great-grandmother. Um, her daughter was Louise, married Harry Barton. Grandma Rolleri had a ferry uh, down in the river. And shortly after the shooting of Black Bart and what have you, she moved up to Angel's Camp. She sold the ferry, her husband died. She sold the ferry and she took her 10 kids and moved to Angel's Camp. And she bought a boarding house, sort of slash hotel in the center of the block where the Angel's Camp Visitor Center is now. And she expanded that. Eventually, not too far in the future, she had the whole block. Uh, she bought the whole block and she was running a hotel with 50 rooms in it. Really, you know, I mean, the baths were down the halls, it was mining quarters and what have you. But great cooking. Uh, she taught all the Chinese, she had nothing but Chinese cooks, and she taught them how to cook Italian meals. And uh, uh, people would come on Sunday with their little lard pails and take away raviolis. And she loved people and she took care of everybody. I mean, nobody ever went away from the door hungry. If they needed a little grub steak, they got it. Uh, she was just that way. And she was, you know, came from a small Italian village and had uh, virtually no education. Could sign her name, that was about it. But she was a great businesswoman. And she was Grandma Rolleri to uh, a good deal of the state. There were two columns in the front page of the Stockton Record when she passed away. Photograph of her and she was on Death Valley Days. Um, they did a script about her. Uh, she created a, the center of Angel's Camp, and when she died in 1927, it was a little family company, or Larry Company, in 1937, the hotel caught fire and burned down. Just got at the center of town. I can still remember there were big billboards sitting on that lot. I used to play in the, in the ashes. As the county's population grew, fire became a threat that all were forced to contend with. Burning through structures and wildlands, it would continue to reshape life in Calaveras County. Between four and five years uh, of age, I remember one of the first major fires in Angel's Camp, the old Calaveras Hotel. And the old Calaveras Hotel was a major disaster at that time, it burnt down. I saw that only as a fire from the living room of the home that we lived in above the park. But it looked like the whole town of Angel's Camp was on fire. It burnt from actually uh, Hearts Gravel, the street of Hearts Gravel, north actually to an area there where the pickle porch is now in there. That was all burnt down, and there was more than one building in there. The Calaveras Hotel was the major, 
And there was one death in that building at that time. One man lost his life in that building. There was a bank in there, and there was a, a butcher shop in there, Radio's. There was other three or four buildings in there, and a little further up that side of the, um, uh, going north, on that left side of the street, was the Dodge and Plymouth Agency, and that's where the fire stopped there. So that was all vacant in there for many, many years in there. Yeah, the fire in the hotel was a somewhat indeterminate causes, but something caught fire, uh, a curtain or something in the kitchen area, and the fire extinguishers had been just recently replenished by somebody who didn't do the right work. Fire was an ever-present threat to the citizens of Calaveras County. The development of regional fire departments helped shape the culture of the mother load. My dad and Joe Farley were kind of cohorts. My dad was a deputy chief, Joe was a chief, so they had a real strong fire department. And there used to be fire sirens on top of the Calaveras Bank building for years. And they blowed every day for noon as well. It was both a test and an awareness of fire, too. I think it, it had kind of served both purposes, but then they put the fire sirens in Joe's house and in our house. So um, it was kind of a, always interesting to see who could get to the fire phone first. That's the way they called the volunteers. They'd rush to the firehouse, and, and then later on, they even made a fire station out of our house. We had a fire truck at our house, and they called it the Hill Group. Roy Sirocco and Milt Goodridge and myself and Aldi Broyo. And it was easier because you could go downhill faster and uphill. So a lot of times we were, it was who, was who was getting to the fire first, no matter how dangerous sometimes it went. I also joined the Angels Fire Department, the Volunteer Fire Department in 1960 when I was working at Carly's Garage down there. And Joe Carly's was his chief at that time down there. I was very much interested basically in the fire service. I, I, I liked Joe very much and uh, uh, he knew, knew I was a conscientious workman and uh, I wanted to be a fireman. And he had a waiting list. At the time, the city only allowed uh, actually 20 people in the fire service as firemen. They had, later on, uh, auxiliary firemen that was under that, that came on as a rookie type of thing. And there, so I came on in 1960. I was actually 51 years in the volunteer and angels fire. When I was a Boy Scout, we would uh, go out and assist the fire department in burning along all the roads. We'd, in those days, we would protect all the properties by getting rid of the grass next to the road, and sometimes we'd do uh, lots if somebody requested you know, a lot, and if they would provide soda or other uh, interesting things to the firefighter, usually it'd be one or two firefighters and three three of us big Boy Scouts. Uh, so yeah, when I turned 18, I did join the fire department. I was 18, so that would have been 1963. Oh gracious, it was a long time ago. <laughs> and when they signed me up, swore me in, the treasurer, secretary treasurer resigned and they appointed me secretary treasurer. So I had, I had a job the same night that I actually joined. Oh, they also handed me a cardboard box full of records and papers, loose papers and whatever, which it seems like everybody, that's the way they kept their records in those days. So I made a big change. I went and bought a briefcase. At that age, I wasn't thinking of a career path. I was just enjoying what I was doing. You're on call whenever the bell went off, or the siren, they had a siren in those days. If you had a fire or an emergency, you could come downtown to the firehouse, and there was a button on the side of the firehouse, and you could push that button and the siren go off, and people would show up to find out what, 
what was required, what you need. Or you could call Frank Reed, who had the store just down there, or his house behind the firehouse, and he would go over and push the button and call everybody out. And everybody knew what his phone number was. Mm -hmm. It was probably better known than 911. Back then, there were fire districts, just as there is now, but fire districts are, all special districts are created by the people within them for a purpose. So the cemetery districts were created for the cemeteries, fire districts, and they all established certain boundaries. I think it appears that in McCallum Hill's case, they created a district so they, the people would pay taxes in to support whatever it was. And the sanitary district and the fire district were almost, uh, well, they were the same print because somebody had to survey or establish what the boundaries were. Every town, every fire district that exists today was the same way and there was no fire coverage outside of those. And then some people from Ebbets Pass, I can remember a lady coming in complaining they had no fire protection. It was up to the Board of Supervisors to do something. So they created a fire district for everything that wasn't in a fire district. But then they didn't have any firemen. So they came to all the fire districts and said, uh, if you will take care of this property outside your area, uh, we will provide you with turnout gear and, and a fast attack, uh, heavy duty pickup with water and stuff. So that's when, uh, that's when the first time we got uh, gear, real, otherwise you were in Levi's and uh, uh, denim shirts. Although the presence of fire was not new to Calaveras, the citizens had yet to face their biggest challenge. In the late summer of 2015, Calaveras would contend with the devastating Butte fire. Could you tell me about the Butte fire? Because I, I think that's a huge, it, it's, I know you're very humble about it, but I think that a lot of people really um, talk about it and talk about how you were able to get everybody together and. Can you tell us about that? If I get too wound up, so shut me up, because I can get a little excited about it, but you know the fire started. Uh, gonna evacuate. Uh, no, we're not gonna leave. I got, I got 500 goats in one place, and I got 500 goats in another place, and all the neighbors, we're talking about neighbors, called, can we help, can we help, can we help you evacuate? We don't need to go anything. I can protect all this stuff myself. Somebody show up here. The Whittle Boys were some of them that showed up. The Woosters, my son-in-law from Sacramento, sent a watering truck up. And I like to describe it sometimes as when we were young. If you went to a fight, you went there to fight. And you weren't gonna lose. That's the way we attacked this fire. We kept waiting and didn't think it would get to us. Didn't think it would get to us. And then we watched it at 9, 10 o'clock at night, burn where the lower goats were. We were down there. We moved the goats to a field where there was no feed. It was safe. So we didn't realize, we didn't worry about them anymore. We come home, started protecting neighbors' houses. My son-in-law comes with a water truck. We get to Mountain Ranch. They won't let him come to the ranch. The roads are closed, evacuated. Nobody can come in. All the people want to help me. I talked to the little guy and he said, I can't let you go. And I'm on a four wheeler. I said, well, I'm going home. And I will have my water truck in as soon as I can get, make some contacts. Well, we can't let anybody in. How in the hell can we fight a fire without a water truck? It's here, full of water. Well, we can't let you go in. So I get on the phone. I call the sheriff's office. Who do I get? The dispatcher, my ex-wife. Fine, I mean, we, this is good, we, we, get, we get along. I told her my situation, she said, Doug, just quiet down. quiet down. I called back in 10 minutes, I said, you give me a number to call, we gotta get dispatch from Sacramento. Just, I'll call him, I'll call him. No, Doug, you don't, I'll take care of it. So about five minutes, I get a phone call from Sacramento. I've got water trucks here. 
and you won't let them come to my ranch, put the fire out. What are, where in the hell's your head? I mean, you gotta get me, let these trucks come in. So the widows come, the water trucks come, everybody. So now we're, we're in a defense mood now. We're putting out fire. We had fire lines in, we had water trucks in, we saved the neighbor's house, we saved this house, and we just kept, it was coming closer to us. When we get there, we got a caterpillar, we got two fire trucks, we got 15 guys, 20 guys, I don't know how many. Oh, here comes CDF. Well, we were told to make all this black. I said, not on my watch, this is my cow feed, this is my goat feed, you don't burn it up. We got a gun and start shooting and setting fire. But we put it out as fast as they set it. Got past one barn. They threw out to another barn. You guys have been burning me up. Don't set another goddamn fire here. I got a, there's a dump that's been there for 40 years. It's never been burnt. It'll, if you start that, I'm gonna lose a fire truck, water truck. I gotta stay to watch it because my barns are full of hay. Boom, with the gun shooting up in the field, set everything on fire. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not, I don't get mad, but I was pretty upset. And from there, we go back to the house. We've got it all put out around the house. I got a big pumpkin patch. I raised pumpkins for the kids in Mountain Ranch. They're out in the pumpkin patch, setting it on fire. I said, it won't burn. I've got water. I've watered all of this. I got water. They said, well, the power's off. You won't have any pump. I said, we're here for a hundred years. We've got gravity water, young man, and I can put the fire out. Still setting fire. Go right up back of my house with a con crew. I said, okay. Now, I had a kid there, Jeremy Leonard. Jeremy said, do you want me to hit him? I said, no, we're not gonna hit him. Just get him out of here, just get him out of here. We run him off of there and then he's going toward town. And he sets fire all the way to town. Anyway, we put it out. And if you never, I like to say, look at the map, you saw what we did. That's all I can say. It, uh, lots of help. And neighbors, I mean, he's, we put fire lines everywhere. And you'd ask for help from CDF, 30, 15 trucks parked on the road. And they said, no, we'll wait until it comes to us. Oh, shit. We'll put it out. That wasn't just us. I mean, senators were involved and other people in Mountain Ranch. It wasn't just me. Knowing your resources, what we could get, where we could get it. So. We put it out. Neighborly aid is what got Calaveras through the peak of the Butte fire and the reconstruction efforts. When the Butte fire came, they used our ball field for a staging area and tore the out of it. In the late 60s, early 70s, we'd, we had no park in Mountain Ranch. Everybody had one, Railroad Flat, San Andreas, and that property, real estate, belonged to the school district. So we leased it from the school district for a dollar a year, and we got a $30,000 rural recreational grant. So that started us on building a park. Pacific in the grant was we could pay no labor, only we could pay out of that 30,000 for material. So we got volunteers and went to work and raised money and, and built a park. We have a concession stand, a public toilet, a well, a lot of picnic tables, a horseshoe pit, a playground for kids, and a ballpark. Volunteer labor, we built it. They played a lot of baseball in the early days Everybody had a team. Sheep Ranch had a team. Mountain Ranch had a team. That same year, we had a little league team and adult softball, men's and women's. I organized, I did little league. I build, helped build a park and uh, we did a lot of things that way. And somehow they got the thought that I might do too much so they put my name on it. That kind of makes me responsible for it, which I'm not too sure I'm happy with. Well, it was pretty good up until we had the Butte fire. They left ruts, they had a, a laundromat and all kinds of things on our ball field. So when they left and the fire was over, I went to the county 
to try and repair, get some money to repair the field. And of course the county told me they didn't have no money. So I went to FEMA who was responsible. They thought I was out of line. So it made me about half mad. So I put together a fundraising campaign and raised over uh, $40,000. The Covenant Church in San Andreas gave me $10,000 in cash. K.W. Emerson gave me about $20,000 worth of equipment and work to, to repair it, plus a lot of other. At that time, they were cleaning up the burnt houses where you know, the companies that were here, lots of them, were paid to clean up. And I got a lot of money from them, which I've never been bashful about asking for money. So we repaired the fields and we just started from scratch. Had to rebuild the whole field because it was in such bad shape. So now we have a very nice ball field. So that's one reason they stuck my name on it. So if they do it again, I got to fix it. The supportive community of Calaveras runs deep as veins of gold. Although times have changed and the community continues to grow and evolve, it remains a special place in the hearts of those who have lived it. Where you're raised is a huge attraction, I think, and that that's, draws me back. I mean, I, I've i lived well away from Angel's Camp. I've lived on the East Coast. I've lived in Hawaii. I've spent the last 14 years spending four months a year in New Zealand. But it's friends, and it's country, and it's uh, it has a draw. A lot of people come back here. Uh, the future of Calaveras is... Um probably, you know, a lot of opportunities, but it's finding people to get involved. We're going to be a recreation community or a retirement community for lots of the Bay Area or the metropolitan areas. I mean, we see it already. Even after the fire, I think the COVID, we're seeing people work from here that used to commute. Uh, now they're here. And some of the other people are seeing that that might not be a bit bad way to live and they're doing the same here. It was a small little quiet town at one time. I just lived through all of it. So. When, if you had a problem the neighbors all come to help. I mean they pitched in whether you got along or not you were still neighbors and you, everybody pitched in. Get involved with your neighbors because they're the ones that are going to look out for you. Whatever your recreation is or whatever you're doing is fine but try to get involved with your neighbors and don't hide out like you might have done in the city because you have to rely on your neighbors up here. I don't regret ever living in Angel's Cal. The strongest thing was the relationships I had with people. Some of these people I knew the rest of my life. My great-great-grandmother, Harriet Kirtland, she came out in 1855. Her diary is very special, and um, I just wanted to read a piece. This was May 15th, 1857, and she wrote, when we came into views of the Sierras, the summits covered with snow contrasting so beautifully with the green, it was sublime. And then about a mile from the entrance of the grove, it surpassed all description. I could not help but think how small and insignificant I was compared with all around me, and how little we deserve the goodness of providence. If anything would awe us and give us grand ideas and make us truly noble, generous, and good, surely all that we see around us would. Well, I think she says it best.